Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Davis, and today I'm going to be talking to you about generating music from text and emotion and other experiments. And when I give this talk, I usually like to talk a little bit about data sonification first. And data sonification is exactly like data visualization, except instead of representing data through visuals, you're representing it through sound. Um, I'll show you a few examples of what I mean. Uh, that's one of my favorites. So this next one's very different. It's kind of, um, uh, basically, it's um, sonifying how fast Olympic athletes cross the finish line. And I love this piece. This is by Amanda Cox, who's kind of a legend. Um, I love this piece because if you see this image, you can, you can see how fast they are, you know, how close they are together. But when you listen to it, the impact is much stronger. This next one is by James Murphy of LCD Sound System, and this is different than the other two in that it, it takes kind of a lot of components of the data. This is data from tennis matches. And it takes a bunch of these components, like the player names, the seeds, the temperature, which court they were on, and combines all of those to make kind of a more atmospheric piece. So there are a couple different types of data sonification. The first is audification. And when people get into this field, this is kind of where they start. Um, this is just directly converting data to sound, um, interpreting data as amplitude over time. Um, but what I'm more interested in and what I'll be talking about a little more today are these next two, which are parameter mapping, which is where you're mapping some value of the data to the component of the sound, um, with the focus being on highlighting the data and then music generation, which is the same thing. You're mapping values of data to values of the sound, but the focus is not on conveying the data as much as it is about creating interesting music. And sound has a couple of strengths that visuals don't necessarily have. Um, it's temporal, it's multidimensional, it's really easy to find cycles and patterns and um, just finding structure in data. It's good for small units. It's good for streams of data and hearing changes in streams. Um, like the first stock exchange one we saw, it's good for grabbing attention and humor. And finally, it's, it's naturally emotional, and it moves the listener. So before I continue with music, I want to just talk about my own background in emotional data. I first got interested in emotional data when I found this data set um, maybe five or six years ago called singularly, How Did the Candidates Make You Feel? And all this was was just asking voters how the presidential candidates made them feel. And when I was prototyping like a data visualization, no matter what I did, I couldn't convey what that um, question was really entailing. And around the same time, I found out about these Chernoff bases, which in data visualization, I think, are a little bit um, looked down upon because it's hard to distinguish the different parts of data. Um, you know, you're mapping different parts of the data to different features of the face, but you can see this one here is like a not good one. These are, um, these are like applicant scores. So the eyebrows are related to the autobiography, whatever that means. The smile size is related to the interview score. And it, the visualization here is just not really relevant to the underlying data. But I thought it would be relevant to the how did the candidates make you feel? 
And so I, I ended up mapping um, this question to these Chernoff bases. And so basically, um, the anger was related to the slope of the eyebrows, the fear was related to the, width, the um, size of the eyes, the pride was related to the length of the nose, and the smile was related to the width of the mouth. Um, and so what that ended up doing was, I think over time, um, really representing how people felt about these elections. Like, um, I was, I don't remember that one, but this one was pretty meh for like everyone, you know, no one was really feeling it either way. Um, this one we all remember, like very, a lot of extremes with Bush. Um, and then, of course, we had the Obama hope um, time period. And then, unfortunately, the data set stopped there. This was like something they'd been tracking forever, but uh, I would have loved to have seen this last election. <laughs> um, or maybe I wouldn't have, we'll see. Um, so I, I was interested in emotional data for a while. This was me just like tracking my own facial expressions while browsing the internet, um, where each second was, or each, each square was a second. And um, I used this kind of visualization to do my first sonification. And this was representing um, different authors' writing styles. because you really can hear the different writing styles come through. Like Hemingway has no descriptive words at all. I did that project for a while, but ultimately felt like the pieces that were coming out were too similar. And so I started thinking about like what is interesting to people about you know, their favorite novels and things like that, and it's the emotions. And so I wanted to make a project where I could do the same thing, but with the emotions. And so I had two questions for myself in starting out this project. And the first was, can I translate emotions between mediums? Can I make a piece of music that has the emotions of a novel? Um, and can I create a musical piece with the same underlying tone as the novel, all programmatically? And so for a few years, I worked on a project called Trans Transprose, which is basically a mapping between text analysis and music composition. And how it works is um, I'm using a word emotion association lexicon to get these uh, splines of emotion counts throughout the novel. Um, and increase, I increase the melodic movement at particularly emotional points. And what this means is that the plot is created not in the literal events, but in the emotional representation of the events. And I'll play you a few pieces here, but before I do, I want to play you a few things that went wrong um, so I can appropriately set your expectations. Um, the first couple pieces were missing a few things, um, including complexity. Order. And emotional accuracy. This is Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. <laughs> so I fixed that. Um, so let me play you a few. And if you'd like, you can look at some of the mappings and try to uh, suss out parts of the novel, but you're also just welcome to listen.
Now on the other end of the spectrum. And then this next one is very different um, because the protagonist is doing really, really horrible things in a happy tone, and I think it's captured in the music. Oops. So I did a couple other projects using this um, generating from text structure. I sonified the 2016 debates, um, which was more funny at the time. Um, <laughs> so overall, Clinton was more positive and active. Trump was more negative and passive. But both candidates had high levels of trust, anticipation, and fear, which I think makes sense when discussing the future. And I actually didn't compare them to each other, but I compared them to themselves over the course of the three debates. Um, I'm not going to play the whole thing, each piece for you. Um, I'll play a little bit just so you can hear the difference. So the first debate, um, this is Clinton's first debate. This is the baseline. So on the second debate, her joy levels rose. And then on the third debate, her fear levels rose. For Trump, here's his baseline. <laughs> on the second debate, his anger and fear levels rose. the third debate, his anger levels rose above all other emotions. But yeah, let's move on from that. Um, so another thing I did was a piece called Symphonology with a uh, French composer. Um, and this was kind of the first time I'd worked with a human composer. And so basically, I created a couple of um, pieces based on news articles talking about the rise of technology over time. And he fleshed those out into a full-scale orchestra. So this was a much longer piece, but I'll play you a little clip of it. So after this, I um, decided to do a couple of pieces, sorry, a couple of pieces that weren't text-based. 
Um, so this was one of the first pieces that didn't use the structure of text to generate music. And I intentionally chose this UFO sightings data set to see if I could find structure in a seemingly chaotic data set. Um, and it turns out I can. The pattern in this data set is that most UFO sightings happen in evening hours. So it creates this nice underlying rhythmic structure. Um, these, this is just a sample of uh, some of the sightings. So this is based on samples, but I also wanted to do a more formal composition based on it. So um, this is that piece. So another thing I've been working on is trying to generate music from film, um, kind of creating automatic soundtracks. And this is a project that's still in the early stages. Um, I'll play you just my first prototype. And this was my, uh, my question to myself was basically, is it possible to just create a score using the note C? Um, so I'll show you the results of that. Can you turn that up a bit? So this is all programmatically generated based on the content of the video. works better for some genres than others. Um, so one piece I did this spring that I loved was this piece called Fabrica Alta. And this is a factory, one of Italy's like most well-known industrial factories um, that had kind of been abandoned. And more recently, this um, Italian collective D20 kind of revived it and actually turned it into a musical instrument. Um, and so they've been commissioning like computer musicians to generate pieces for it. And what was cool about this project was they, um, they gave me two sets of samples, one of sounds of the factory as it actually was when it was actually in use, um, you know, like the looms and the people speaking and footsteps and things like that, and then another one of children pretending to be the factory. Um, so I used a little bit of machine learning with this. I used um, just like some basic clustering to kind of see where the natural or the, the older and newer sounds combined and use that to inform some of my decisions. And I'll play you a little bit of this piece. So this was the simulator they provided.
And then this was actually played on the building, which was super cool. So I want to go back to the data for a second. Um, so as I mentioned, with transposed, I used this lexicon. And I used it for years without really examining it. And when I finally did, I saw this. And what this is implying is that the word childbirth, along with several others, um, was tagged with no emotions, which seemed weird. Um, so this got me really interested in the idea of subjective data. And, uh, I'm still exploring this space, but a couple of ideas and questions that have come up in this research um, include, you know, how do we incorporate emotions and other subjective experiences into AI, like especially as AI starts moving into more complex and personal spaces, um, and especially when we're modeling things like personality and other people's life experiences. I'm really into this idea of artisanal data, um, which is kind of creating and curating explicitly smaller um, data sets to be creative for like artistic machine learning, and I'll show you one of those in a bit. Um, deconstructing objectivity in data sets in general, like what type of subjectivity do we find in really commonly used um, machine learning data sets? Um, how were they created? What were the motivations? Who ended up tagging these? Um, things that are really informing our society quite a bit at this point. Um, historical bias, I really firmly believe that data sets create, they, they basically take a, 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 they capture a culture's values in any certain time. Um, so how do we kind of avoid that bias retention over time? Is it possible to update data sets? Um, which brings me to labels, you know, where did this data come from? What are the ingredients in the data set? Um, what should the expiration date of this data set be? This is something I'm really interested in and exploring. And of course, who will be allergic to this? Um, I think data sets should have labels like food has labels. And along the lines of labels, I think you know, exploring creative taxonomies is another way um, to explore subjective data sets. You know, maybe instead of um, you know, asking for gender or something when you are getting demographics, maybe you ask for, you know, do you like the ocean or mountain different uh, more? Um, how many years have you spent in a rural or city environment? You know, tr trying to change our, the way we think about demographics and things like that. Um, so I, I've started to do some experiments in this area, and the first is this data set of emotion-tagged landscapes. So there's seven sets of landscapes, fields, forests, oceans, roads, lakes, cities, and mountains, and then um, eight emotions, anger, anticipation, joy, fear, disgust, trust, surprise, sadness, and then also none. And so um, I created a, uh, a couple thousand images data set from Flickr, and had people tag them with Crowdflower, which is kind of like Mechanical Turk, except I like it slightly better because it has a slightly tighter feedback loop between the person who's creating the job and the person who's tagging it. Um, and the one real big obstacle in creating this subjective data set was that um, uh, it's really hard to ask people to tag emotions, and this is made even harder because Crowdflower asks you to make objective answers so it can weed out bots and things like that. And so I got a lot of angry people, you know, um, you know, how can you say that this is incorrect? And so one thing I ended up doing was um, saying that any answer is right as long as they didn't select 
none, and an emotion. And Crowdflower also has this nice like feedback loop where you are rated by the taggers so you can know that you're not just like totally destroying their lives. Um, so some of the results were really cool. Like this is, this is field over a couple different emotions. You see the joy field, trust field, the two anger fields at the bottom. Um, disgust had a lot of browns and greens. Uh, a lot of disgust images were either swamps or um, like dirt or water in places it didn't really seem to belong. Um, fear, these are some fear results. So we have like a very obviously scary forest at the top left here. Um, and then a pretty scary like looming storm. And then this last one actually confused me for a while until I realized that uh, it's pretty common to have a fear of just like the wide open ocean. So it was cool that the taggers were actually like getting both visual um, emotions, but also like conceptual emotions as well. And then um, surprise was interesting because it had a lot of bright colors. So there were a lot of things I learned about the data set. Um, and I wanted to try to see if I could just like transfer the style. Like could I actually translate content between emotions? And so I did this using the NVIDIA fast style transfer that came out maybe a year ago. Um, so on the top left is, um, or the top are the two inputs, so that's fear to joy, and the bottom is the output. So this is translating a forest from fear to joy, um, from joy to fear, so the bottom one's the output. That's a pretty scary forest. Um, it didn't always work, especially with clouds. This is a fear to trust field. <laughs> um, an anger to joy city, it's just a little less gloomy. Uh, joy to fear forest, sadness to joy ocean. And then um, one thing, so this summer I, I was a scholar at OpenAI and I focused on actually seeing if I could generate um, landscapes kind of from scratch, like emotional landscapes from scratch. Um, so my question to myself was, can I generate emotional variations of the same base image? And so I'm gonna show you a couple of these. Um, and so each of the rows that I'm about to show you represents the same set of base generated images. And they're pretty small images um, at, because this is just a proof of concept with a pretty small data set. But as these change, if you keep your eye on one or two of the columns, you can see how they change across emotions. So this is anger, anticipation, disgust, a lot of browns and greens again, fear, joy, sadness, surprise, and trust. And I'll show you quickly a second set. I also tried to generate specific landscapes. So these are generated mountains. Um, again, anger's very dark. Anticipation with mountains was actually um, not very bright. Discussed again, a lot of browns and, and uh, greens. Sadness is a little muted. And then trust is kind of calm. And then I did the same thing for generated forests. So dark and blacks and purples for anger. Lighter anticipation. Browns and greens for disgust. Darker for fear. Really bright for joy. A little muted for sadness brighter colors for surprise, and then um, calmer for trust. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>